This is what Tabasco's original red sauce looks like years before it arrives at grocery stores. It starts here, aging inside these barrels in southern Louisiana. It takes five years to make a bottle of Tabasco sauce. It's a long time. And the recipe inside hasn't changed since 1868. Red peppers, vinegar, and salt. And even as the company's grown, it's managed to keep much of the production inside its headquarters on Avery Island. But Tabasco's storied home is now under threat. The factory is surrounded by shrinking marshes, making it vulnerable to hurricanes. And the company has spent millions on storm protection. It changes drastic from storm to storm. You can see the, the marsh deteriorating. Uh, what you do is you get out there and you, you plan again. You try and hold what you got. We head to southern Louisiana to see how the sixth generation of the McElhenney family is fighting for the survival of its hot sauce and home. Tabasco grows peppers just for seeds inside this greenhouse. We're also looking for the plants that produce the richest color red peppers at perfect size and then flavor too. Christian Brown is the great, great, great grandson of founder Edmund McElhenney and the company's agriculture manager. Yeah, everything's looking good, no signs of aphids. He sends only the strongest seeds to over a thousand Tabasco farms around the world. Tabasco says their peppers originate from the Amazon in South America. They're about six times hotter than a jalapeno, and they're tiny, only one to one and a half inches long and weighing a gram each. Because the peppers are so small and easily damaged, machines don't do the harvesting. They're all hand-picked. Tabasco harvests 10 million pounds of peppers a year. This footage is from Louisiana, but the process looks similar abroad. They sprinkle salt on the peppers and use a giant machine to mash them into a paste. Farms ship the paste back to Avery Island through the port of New Orleans. This mash is actually from Peru. We have 50,000 pounds of Tabasco mash inside that container bulked in. This pump siphons the paste into white oak barrels. Some are 60 years old. Most of these barrels in here are essentially a used bourbon barrel. I don't really have the answer. I know it works, and we've been doing it 150 plus years, so I'm not changing it. A team works together to fill and seal each one. One truckload will fill up to 110 barrels, but they can't overfill them because if you have too much pressure, sometimes those caps blow off. Sometimes the lids will pop off overnight. It's a really simple fix. Just kind of move it to the barrel next to it. It can take 30 minutes to finish one row. Since they're old, the barrels don't have a perfect seal. So workers pour salt on top. It lets gases escape while limiting oxidation. Salt on top is, is just an extra protective layer. There is an imperfection that will help. The team stacks each barrel by mash origin. So this whole bay here, going as far back to, as you can to get to the wall, is, is about 1,100 barrels of Columbia 2022. The mash releases lots of gases during fermentation, so a tiny valve on top helps relieve the pressure. You have to have some ventilation process or it's going to explode. And that happens sometimes. It's like a Tabasco ghost. They come in here at night and they pop the lids off and we come back and there's six or seven we have to fix. After three years, the mash inside will stabilize, shrink, and darken in color. We can see that it was filled to about this level here. And you can start to see rings on the side of that barrel where the mash is going down. Even though it's shrunk, the aged mash is still really spicy. No coffee? Not yet, not yet, but it is hot. So let's remember, this is 10 times more hot than actual sauce. Next up, the aged mash is pumped into the blending room. Here, the pepper smell will hit you right in the back of the throat. 
I could say like getting maced, I guess, every day. It can really hit you hard. But that's how I put my kids through college, so I'm, I'm good with that. I, I love it. Morris Montgomery oversees blending, but he goes by Nook. The Army veteran ensures all the sauce tastes the same, even though it's coming from around the world. I try to do it three or four different countries and put them together. So it could be like a little Colombia, Peru, and a little Ecuador and Honduras. He pumps in vinegar and blends it all for up to 28 days. 72 tanks mix at the same time. Strainers remove pepper pulp and seeds. Nook will take a sample for the lab to test for pH, and then... This is finished Tabasco sauce, and this is ready to go. Uh, next step to the bottling floor. That's where John Simmons comes in. And I'm also a member of the sixth generation of the McElhinney family to make Tabasco sauce. John's factory fills up to 700,000 bottles every day, from minis to the iconic five ounce one. It also pumps out nine different flavors, from original red to habanero. Sriracha is the company's fastest growing one. Today, machines do most of the filling, capping, and labeling. So a bottle is going to go through in about 13 minutes. They gather the bottles and package them into cardboard boxes. We're doing it really fast at like 300 bottles a minute. Next, the shipping room. So we've got product for Germany, Japan, Sweden, Taiwan, the Canary Islands, South Africa. Typically, all these newly packaged products leave the warehouse within three weeks. While the sauce is definitively global, Avery Island has always been home. This was where founder and former banker Edmund McElhenney first grew the tiny red peppers. He bottled his first hot sauce in 1868, sealed it with wax, and sold just under 700 bottles around the Gulf Coast. Each one cost a dollar. He named the brand Tabasco, after the Mexican state known for spice production and exports. Edmund got a patent for it, and by the early 1870s was selling his bottles across the U.S. and even in Europe. And then it kind of started to take a little steam and get bigger and bigger. In one 24-hour period, we're going to double and then some more of what Edmund did in his entire life. Edmund lived on Avery Island, which is a natural salt dome rising 163 feet above sea level. As the highest point along the U.S. Gulf Coast, it's been a respite from raging hurricanes for the McElhenney descendants that still call the island home. But it's now at risk. Louisiana's coast sinks by an average of a third of an inch per year. On average, between 1985 and 2010, the state lost roughly a football field of wetlands every hour. When land sinks, it's more vulnerable to storm damage. It changes drastic from storm to storm, depending where it makes landfall at. Um, you, can, you can see the, the marsh deteriorate. Heath Romero is Avery Island's land manager. He said when Hurricane Rita hit in 2005, it turned this island into a lake and parts of the marsh were destroyed. After Rita, the company built an 18-foot levee with a pump system around the factory. We put in uh, water control structures to stop the salt water from getting to the cypress trees. They also planted tall grasses for protection. And you can see we, we recovered all of this marsh that was open water at one time. But it's a slow-moving process, especially as the home of Tabasco enters another hurricane season. You can't wait for, for, for somebody else to help you. You, you. you have to take action in your own self and try, and try and protect what you have. If you're going to put Tabasco habanero, you got to put it on vanilla ice cream. Use a drop per spoonful. It's perfectly okay to eat it out of the carton. I know that's discouraged, but eat it out of the carton. One drop of habanero per spoonful of vanilla ice cream. It's amazing. Tabasco and peanut butter is the sneaky great thing that most people don't know about. 